Prefatory Note of 'Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kaylee Zervogel. 'Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Prefatory Note. When the story of 'Tilda Jane appeared serially in the Youth's Companion in 1901. The original manuscript was very much condensed. When the time for book publication arrived, nearly all the omitted matter was restored. However, some incidents were still left out, and they have formed the beginning of a new story written to please the many boys and girls who have expressed a wish to know something more of the fortunes of the orphan and her dogs. In this new story, a statement made by the editor at the conclusion of the serial, The Companion, has been ignored, namely that Tilda Jane grew up and married her friend and benefactor, Hank. This statement was not in the original manuscript, and it has seemed advisable to keep Tilda Jane for the present a young girl and the adopted sister for the good-natured Hank, without looking too far into the future. That the orphan's old friends will follow with interest her often groping and stumbling, yet never wearying steps along the path of uplift for human beings and dumb creatures, is the earnest hope of the author. That she should be awakened to a new interest in life, namely the care of birds, who are perhaps the weakest and most defenseless of God's creatures, seemed a fitting addition to her character. Another matter, perhaps worth mentioning, Milkweed, the horse, has been made of a sociable disposition, for an acute critic observed that one lack in horse stories is that the great sociability of their natures is not properly accentuated. Marshall Saunders, Halifax, September 20th, 1909 End of Prefatory Note Recording by Kaylee Zervogel. Chapter One of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter One Hank Has a Laughing Fit. What you laughing at? asked the Frenchman softly. Receiving no answer, he continued to stare at the fat young man who was doubled up over the garden gate in a convulsion of amusement. What you laughing at? he presently repeated and his gaze went from the young man to the little snowbound cottage behind him. It's cold tonight, air like snaps. And you with no big fur coat on, nor hat, he added in his ruminating way. Hank Dilson straightened himself, and still shaking with laughter, nodded over his shoulder toward the cottage. I'm a laughing at what's going on in there and i don't feel the cold because i've got a coating of flesh on my bones since i came home so thick that jack frost can't get at me in less than an hour come on here you've been a good neighbor to us for years come and look in this window i ain't gonna tell everyone but there's no harm in your knowing Hissed now, and he led the way softly over the frozen path between the heaped up snowbanks to the back of the cottage. Pausing a few feet from the kitchen window, he said, Look now, see, stare. Ain't that what you call cute? The Frenchman saw nothing amusing. The owner of the cottage, old Mr. Dilson, Hank's father, sat in his big chair by the kitchen fire his elbow was on the arm of the chair his white head rested on his hand he seemed to be sunk in a reverie he usually sat in that position the frenchman saw nothing cute about him tilda jane the little lean shrewd girl who kept house for the two dilson men sat in a small rocking chair her dark face expressing very little emotion of any kind. 
though the frenchman imagined that her gaze was bent in slightly puzzled inquiry on the third figure in the room the third person was quite unknown to the frenchman she was a great lumbering overgrown girl or woman who might be any age from eighteen to twenty-five while tilda jane and the old man sat slightly back from the fire this huge girl had drawn up close to it and her enormous feet in their men's shoes rested boldly on the hearth no ain't she cute reiterated hank choking back an explosive guffaw a regular cow moose poor tilda poor young sister i don't understand drawled the frenchman with a mystified gesture this a friend who visit friend no exclaimed hank clapping his hand over his mouth come on off here and i'll explain and he dragged the frenchman hurriedly along the path and again burst into a fit of merriment it's still cold said the frenchman patiently come will you in my house and we can talk hank making a frantic effort to control himself followed the frenchman who half puzzled half flattered for his american neighbor rarely had time or took time to visit him led the way to his own kitchen there as usual sat grandfather and grandmother by the fire some children and two dogs played about the room while the house mother sat knitting amidst a certain amount of uproar one lad the eldest of the family stood in a corner squeaking on a violin and singing softly to himself one of the songs of his native land vive la canadienne vol mon cor vola vive la canadienne et se joli ye do jean loves the song remarked his father proudly i think he make fine singer some day hank choked back a last gust of feeling stepped into the hot little room and saluted his french neighbors with great amiability and good humor they were only foreigners he reflected but very decent neighbors very decent i'm elbowed out of my own house mrs meliquan he said in his thick good-natured voice we've got a stranger in there so big that there doesn't seem to be accommodation for us both in the same room a stranger yes said the frenchwoman softly i see her arrive at sundown you were with her also the little tilda jane she paused here her native politeness keeping her from asking questions yet her curiosity shone so strongly from her face that hank launched himself on a tide of narration trying meanwhile not to talk and laugh at the same time one of his besetting sins seems like only last week he began that i was driving through the woods down marsden way and was stopped by a child with a dog done up in a shawl and yet it was two whole years ago mrs meliquan nodded her head yes yes how often has she told us of your goodness you took her in your sleigh you sent her to take care of your poor father she a leetle child without a family she found a home that she loves that she loves my children as you do yours she remarked emphatically glancing round at the ring of interested faces for children and dogs had stopped their play and the boy with the violin had drawn near and was staring at the american caller yes continued hank modestly i know tilda jane set store by her home though she had a tough time at first he added 
with an uneasy look at his hosts let em do uttered a hollow voice from the corner they all gazed in the direction of the old grandfather who had just spoken and mrs melacon laughed softly there speaks the dear grandfather he and the grandmother are listening to you and he will have no blame on his next door friend some do amiable things some do the bad we cannot change but we can spoke up her husband excitedly mr dealson he change this is so exclaimed hank bringing down his fat fist on the table my father has changed and i tell you neighbors it's owing to that young girl who has been good and patient she mastered him but i misdoubt she's got herself into a peck of trouble now i guess you've all heard her talk as i have of getting another orphan to coddle and comfort and make her forget the frowns of the cold world yes yes said the woman eagerly we have said she i will send to the asylum where i was raised in trouble i will ask them to send me another edle girl the most unhappy they have who like me wishes for a good home with a little rocking chair and someone to love her a little rocking chair exclaimed hank and despite his best efforts he went off into another peal of laughter the frenchwoman threw up her hands with an excited gesture mr dealson that that grand lady is not the leetle new orphan hank bobbed his head violently and when he could get his breath exclaimed that grand lady as you call her by which i suppose you mean that big lady that monstrous lady that heavy-heeled lady is tilda jane's orphan and i tell you she's got a handful but i do not understand said mrs melacon in a dismayed tone she your adopted sister tilda jane wish for a leetle girl a quite leetle girl hank mopped his hot face with his handkerchief and moved further from the fire yes that's right but at the last i put my spoke in the wheel says i look here tilda when you first come here i wanted you to go to school but we couldn't afford it now my salary's been raised and we can get someone to help with the housework and waiting on father you've been studying three times a week at night with that good woman mrs tracy for two years but that ain't enough and you're tired when it comes dark he paused for breath and the frenchwoman nodded her head benevolently mrs tracy yes yes i know her a good lady she takes interest in all who wish for help well as i wanted tilda jane to do regular school work hank continued i said when you write for your orphan don't ask for a baby get a sizable one that can help you good i didn't tell her to ask for a beanpole however i didn't see her letter to the lady boards as she calls the women who manage the institution it's half my opinion that they've put a shrewd trick on her out of spite for the slip she gave them when she ran away the little girl suffered much in that asylum said the frenchwoman with a shudder it wasn't managed right replied hank all asylums ain't like that there's a new kind with separate cottages for the children that is fine some old bodies with backward notions ran this marsden one but mr tracy's got ahead of them the husband of the good mrs tracy inquired mrs melacon the same 
he's as good as she is and though hank did not tell the french people he paused an instant to think inwardly and gratefully of his present good position in the waysmith lumber mill due to mr tracy's interest in him yes mr tracy got ahead of them hank continued and in an awful smart way after tilda jane told him how unhappy she had been there he had a quiet investigation made he's a man that's got a lot of influence and when he found our little girl's charges were true he made up his mind he'd break the thing up whether the lady managers suspected him or not i don't know but they've had to shut up the right wing of their asylum and the left wing and now i believe it's a question of giving up the main body how did he do it asked the frenchman curiously he has an informer nearby and as soon as he knows of one orphan or a batch of orphans being sent to the asylum he tries to get someone to adopt them he writes here there and everywhere and farmers and their wives from every part of the old pine tree state bear down on that asylum and lug the orphans off to their farms in open places or to settlements in the woods perhaps then said mrs meliquan the ladies had not so many children to give your little sister a choice that's a point for them said hank i wouldn't be surprised if the maypole next door might have been their last hope but you will not let her keep this this elevated person asked the frenchwoman anxiously not for a horse and buggy said hank warmly not if tilda jane don't want her but what i'm fearing is that she'll think it her duty to keep this elevated person as you call her and train her in the way she should go tilda is a mighty hard person to move when she gets on the duty track she's a good leetle girl said the woman softly she's not like most others she started sad and it smoothed out the badness most children have indeed she is good said hank vigorously she's made a home for me and father and i tell you when a fellow knocks round in country hotels and boarding-houses as i have he just warms up to a good fireside and his own chair and plate at the table and she's clever too murmured mrs meliquan clever ejaculated hank she's a napoleon it's a pity she hadn't a good start in the world good parents good health and a good education them that's bound to get on gets on said the frenchman solemnly oh i have no patience with that saying remarked hank if you're bound to get on you do but you'd have done better to have had a helping hand tilda jane's a smart girl but i dare say she'll flatten out as a woman no young critter ought to have any care but to put food in its mouth and to play and learn look at the factory young ones what kind of men and women do they make all the life is drained out of em hear that my children said the frenchwoman are you not glad that you have a home and parents who put food and books before you the poor tilda jane had worry and sorrow as a young child well i must go said hank jumping up tilda jane will be wondering where i am good night to you all good night sir good night said the french family in unison and hank after making his best bow to the grandparents swung himself out of the room End of chapter 1 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 2 of Tilda Jane's Orphans This is a LibriVox recording. 
All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by John Brandon. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 2 A Conflict of Wills. Before entering his own back door, Hank took the precaution of looking in the window. His father had gone to bed, and the slight dark Tilda Jane stood in the middle of the kitchen, looking up at the tall, clumsy newcomer who towered above her. Pon my word, muttered Hank, that big girl is the ugliest woman I ever saw, all except her hair, he added, as he surveyed the abundant reddish brown locks combed back in a tidy mass from the plain featured face. That hair is fine good color soft as silk and well groomed she ain't slack if she is gawky and his eye ran approvingly over her clean cotton dress as he lifted the latch of the kitchen door tilda jane was just saying patiently and so your name is garraby yes miss garraby replied the newcomer with emphasis on the miss miss garraby repeated tilda jane but what is your first name it ain't no matter about my fust name said the girl doggedly a fust name in a grown person is like the knocker on the front door it ain't often in use cept for weddin's and funerals we ain't that is we are not expecting to have either weddings or funerals said tilda jane calmly but i'd like to know what to call you seems to me i told you my name said miss garraby stiffly but i can't say miss garraby every time i speak to you why can't you hank stood silently staring at them the new girl kept rolling a cunning eye at him as if wondering whether he were going to interfere or not tilda jane after an affectionate glance at him as he entered the door did not look at him she was absorbed in the new girl and not being easily beaten she presently returned to the attack with quiet persistence you expect to call me by my first name don't you of course i do you're tilda jane leetle tilda jane you come here to help me with the work continued tilda jane i don't expect to call you servant because i notice all the girls get mad when you say that miss garraby bridled haughtily don't you servant me i be a lady and an orphan said tilda jane with a fleeting smile now if we're to work together like sisters it would be very funny for me to call you miss i don't see no fun nowhere retorted miss garraby gazing about her with a mystified air and i be older than you if there ain't no fashion to the order of calling me miss we'll start it tilda jane quick to take advantage of an opening remarked you say you are older than i am how old are you Miss Garraby hesitated an instant. Then she said oracularly, I be what I am. Only the parson, what marries me, and the feller that gets me, can raise the laugh on me, count of my age. As if by chance, her eye as she spoke roved comprehensively over Hank. The fat young man gave a distinct shudder, but he stepped manfully out of the dark background and set his teeth firmly. Tilda Jane frowned, and for a few seconds busied herself in stepping to the nearby table and lowering the wick of the lamp that had begun to smoke. She had a strange, unchildish like dislike for unbecoming levity, and when she next spoke, it was with a hard tone in her voice. Since you won't tell me your age, she said, I'll call you thirty. Thirty? ejaculated miss garraby with a contemptuous snort twenty-five then continued tilda jane that is too much i see by your face twenty-two 
oh you look uneasy you're twenty we can stop there miss garraby gave her a furious stare then with the uncomfortable consciousness that when it came to a question of brains this slight young girl might get ahead of her she said gruffly i want to go to bed give me a candle certainly replied tilda jane when we have settled about the name i've got to write the lady boards i mean the ladies that run things at the asylum whether we'll keep you keep me exclaimed miss garraby is it talk of keep i thought it was talk of stay there's no talk of stay now remarked tilda jane coolly there's a question of go if you'll tell me your first name and if my adopted brother agrees she said turning respectfully to hank i guess i'll keep you miss garraby began to waver i laid out to run things myself she said lingeringly when i see how young and small you be i ain't never been no mistress nowhere and i'm hankerin for power maybe some day you'll have a house of your own said tilda jane consolingly who's boss here anyway inquired miss garraby tilda jane pointed to hank and i figured i'd be murmured miss garraby while well, he's big enough she said half admiringly half contemptuously bosses aren't made said tilda jane they just come natural mr hank pays the bills he has to be the boss the little girl stifled a tired yawn as she spoke and hank with a glance at the clock stepped forward look here young woman you garraby you you've come here to be company for this young girl if you like it stay and take her orders with no sour looks if you don't like it get out there's a train at ten thirty for bangor now what is it to be ang root for bed or ang root for the station overcome by his decided manner and his mysterious attempt at french miss garraby succumbed but not with meekness i be called perletta garraby she said flauntingly as she took up her candlestick and my age is nineteen i run away from home when i was six and i'll run away from here if you bosses me give me some matches will you and don't call me early for i be dead sleepy after she got her matches she went lumbering across the kitchen and up the stairway when she slammed her bedroom door behind her tilda jane and hank with one accord smiled at each other then drew two chairs up to the stove End of chapter two recording by john brandon chapter three of tilda jane's orphans this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by john brandon tilda jane's orphans by marshall saunders chapter three what is the matter with grandpa sissy said hank solemnly i thought you'd got a handful but upon my word it's more than that it's an armful it's more than an armful hank replied the little girl soberly it's a heartful and we were so smug he said lugubriously gazing about the neat kitchen just like three bugs in a rug tilda jane being wholly taken up with the compliment to herself saw no inelegance in the comparison we were she said and will be why you don't think you can stop that mule from kicking there's no fun in kicking if there isn't anything to kick at she's fresh from the asylum hank that's so he said thoughtfully and he stared at the expiring fire seems to me most orphans had kind of tired out parents said the little girl wistfully parents that didn't stand by their children some parents can't said hank mildly they have poor health or die but those that live for a while said tilda jane wearily our new orphans parents used to beat her before they died she was telling me before you come 
i mean you came in she ran away to the woods to the indians after giving this information tilda jane fell into a long and painful brown study and hank by way of arousing her said at last how long do you think parents ought to stand by their children i mean how long should they keep them at home before they let them go out into the cold world oh i don't know i don't know said tilda jane with sudden fire but as long as they can it's so hard to grow up hank so hard children should have their time there's some folks in this very town said hank agitating for more laws against child labor that is children working for pay they say worn-out children ain't any good to the state while healthy boys and girls make citizens that bring in money they're remunerative in fact i don't know about that said tilda jane with a look on her face as if she was striving to understand him and could not but i know that god made children he tells them to play they ought to have their time for it trouble comes soon enough you're right sissy you're right and now don't you think you'd better pass on this trouble to someone else you mean perletta i mean miss garraby tilda jane smiled i'll do as you say hank she remarked humbly but would it worry you if i marched her back to the asylum it's just as you say i often lay no lie awake a spell nights turning over things in my mind said tilda jane thoughtfully i guess i'd be just as wakeful if she went cause she wants to stay don't you know hank you like to see your trouble not worry about it being away off in the dark where you can't get at it you're dreadful disappointed in her though he said sharply well said the little girl impartially i'll not say no if you ask me if i am but it isn't because she hasn't the blue eyes and curly hair i've always hankered for being one that folks never turn to look after in the street hush up tilda you're good and that's better than being blue-eyed and curly-haired i'm not good hank she said turning two tearful dark eyes on him i have awful ugly feelings sometimes i just blush at myself you're good enough for me he said doggedly we were trying to ravel out things about perletta she said shortly and i was going to say that it's her inward contrariness that will bother me but unless you say the word stop i guess i'll make up my mind to have and to hold her there's good in her brother all right he said rising and stretching himself and now as the fire has just gone to sleep i guess i'll follow its example i'm tired for we had a lively day at the mill mr waysmith wanted some old accounts you're getting on well aren't you hank the little girl inquired anxiously no trouble and you like your work you bet i do being only assistant the old bookkeeper takes most of the responsibility and i'm glad for mr waysmith is a hard man the little girl shuddered how is he hard hank is he cross for faults he just jumps on us sissy when anything goes wrong i'd rather get under the big saw than face him tilda jane became pale and drawing in her breath she murmured lord help me when i have to march up to him father went to bed some time ago didn't he asked hank suppressing a huge yawn tilda jane with a start called back her wandering thoughts yes he went at half past seven hank she added hesitatingly and her two dark eyes were eager and piercing as she stared at him was your father all his life kind of brooding and droopy like with spasms by turns as he is now oh no said hank lightly tis only since he quit work old folks are like that 
they're thinking over past days but it seems to me he isn't natural persisted tilda jane how not natural inquired hank good-naturedly but with a careless accent you're such a one to stew over trifles tilda well said the little girl thoughtfully when i come no when i came here he was just like a dear old gun that was always going off when you didn't expect it to there were neither times nor seasons with him i don't call that natural and when he lost that money before you come home i laid it to that but he forgot the sixty dollars he never found and now he is just like he was at first that is about fretting he isn't so ugly to folks oh that's just elderly cussedness said hank lazily yes but what makes it old folks are apt to boil over but he used to be boiled over all the time and now he tries to hide it but i know he's simmering to himself hank shook his head you've got me up a tree sissy wait till i'm almost eighty and i'll tell you the little girl held her breath and looked at him strangely seems as if he must have some load on his mind she said at last in a low voice hank was shrewd enough to catch her meaning now what could my old dad have on his mind he said irritably you're the most aggravating young one tilda if you ain't got any trouble you go sniffin around and make some father's mane improved now he don't fling his crutches at your dogs any more and he don't yell at you so often i say he's a changed character now why can't you rest on that you don't sleep well said tilda jane wearily no old folks do they don't exercise how can they sleep he calls out in his sleep said the little girl doggedly hank stepped forward and stood threateningly over her now look here young one you sleep with your door shut at night after this do you hear yes she said meekly all day long you're bearing on your pinched shoulders the troubles of this household and soon you'll have the troubles of the whole town of ciscasset you've got to stop it if you worry all night as well as all day you'll soon be as lean as a greyhound my father is all right he's got the dinner bell if he wants anything in the night and rings it i'll hear now will you mind me yes hank she said quietly don't you want a piece of pumpkin pie before you go to bed i guess i do sissy is it in the pantry no i put it in the oven to take the chill off and she went to the stove and there's a cup of milk covered up on the shelf over there for you good night i guess i'll go upstairs ain't you gonna look after your dogs asked hank curiously tilda jane turned back with a start you must have something pretty brain-scattering going on inside you or you'd never forget your animals remarked hank a little uneasily and neglecting his pie he turned a critical eye on his adopted sister tilda jane aware of his disapproving watchfulness laughed a little affectedly and said never mind me brother hank i feel kind of dreamy tonight it's that girl he said with a curl of his lip no it ain't i mean it isn't what is it then tilda jane did not reply at first finally she said curtly i hate to lie when it isn't necessary seems to me this is one of the times hank slowly ate his pie but his eyes never left her as she opened the door of the substantial wood house that he had had built onto the house since he came home and brought in a small box of straw reaching under the stove she drew out a small semi-blind three-legged crooked-tailed dog and put him in the box then carefully folding up an old blanket she put it on the floor beside the box for a large hunting dog who came and gratefully curled himself up on it now don't you think there's something the matter with those dogs asked the young man ironically seems to me poacher has a kind of far-away look in his eyes 
maybe he's hankering after the deer in the woods up north stop teasing hank said tilda jane pleadingly yet she smiled as she bent over the hound and lifted his velvet muzzle in her hand what became of the man that owned him asked hank suddenly as his thoughts took a new direction mr lucas said tilda jane oh he's all right he's trying to keep out of the woods in winter so satan won't tell him to go and poach again i write him at times to let him know that poacher isn't going to be a backslider either he says his boys are doing fine he makes them go to school but he has promised to let them go in the sawmill where he works next year suppose that other dog of yours there said hank waving his pie crust in the direction of the little box drawn close to the stove that rickety gippy died what would you do i'd cry my eyes out for a while then i'd get another said tilda jane slowly another orphan remarked hank meditatively yes she replied warmly i like the poor dogs and the sick dogs there are plenty to care for the well-favored ones how old is gippy nobody knows said tilda jane solemnly his muzzle has been white ever since i had him he don't seem to be sleeping well pursued hank slyly as gippy stirred in his sleep and gave a queer little yelp do you suppose that there is something on his mind tilda jane was prematurely old and careworn yet she was still a child in some ways and tenderly shaking the little old dog she burst into sudden laughter wake up gippy there's friends all around you there ain't no i mean there isn't any big dog chasing you maybe he thought his chaser was a cat remarked hank gippy never quailed before a cat said tilda jane decidedly haven't you seen him run at them tail first then turn around and give a bite yes i've seen him gallop after a mouse so hotly said hank that that when it got on his blindest side he'd go most crazy and then in his excitement he'd eat it and forget he'd eaten it and go on looking for it tilda jane was shaking with laughter i've seen him do that she said lots of times and it's queer for he doesn't favor mice for eating we do lots of thing when we're worked up that we wouldn't do sober remarked hank sententiously poacher who had sprung off his blanket to the aid of the dreaming cur now called the little girl's attention to himself by affectionately pressing his head against her arm my beauties she said caressingly and her glance embraced the two dogs what would i do without you you take solid comfort with those beasts don't you said hank but you like dogs too she said anxiously oh yes i like them but not as you do they're only dumb critters to me now a horse tilda jane sprang up oh hank i forgot to ask you did you get a letter from that man to-day yes said hank gloomily and he won't let me have my mare back for less than two hundred and fifty dollars oh brother but you'll raise it i've only got one hundred and fifty could you get a hundred anywhere i could save it out of my salary but it would take too long he'll sell the mare the little girl gave a distressed cry we must have her we must have her you're pretty milkweed then hurrying to a cupboard she drew out an old sugar bowl lifting the cover she said count my berry money hank count it the young man in a bewildered way drew out some bills from the sugar bowl you didn't get all this from selling berries sissy part of it hank currants were all the fashion this year and we had lots of them then when you were on your holidays i saved some from the housekeeping there's twenty-five dollars here said hank with a kind of solemn joy and grandpa has fifty dollars said tilda jane 
he saved it for you from his pension just as soon as he heard about your wanting your horse back he began to scrimp father did exclaimed hank and a sudden glow illuminated his face twas you young monkey that put it in his head suppose i did she said stoutly there was reason for it god bless you said the young man warmly you've been the light of this house ever since you came into it if i get that mare you'll never get out of the sleigh or buggy except for meals at this picture of her busy self driving behind hank's beautiful white streaked mare with only pauses for refreshment tilda jane again burst into such happy whole-hearted laughter that she almost suffocated oh go away hank she exclaimed waving one lean brown hand at him you are so drollish you most choked me hank was not a handsome young man he was stout and decidedly commonplace but in the eyes of his adopted sister he was almost perfect and with a pleased smile irradiating his plain features and whistling softly in order not to disturb his father he tramped off to bed left alone tilda jane tucked her dogs in bed and with a last caress left them to slumber till morning the dogs are all right i'm all right she murmured as she crept out of the room hank is all right that orphan tush she isn't going to fret me much but poor old grandpa poor old grandpa i'm young and little but i must go to see mr waysmith there is no one else for i see i'll get no help from hank mr tracy could go but i can't run blurting poor grandpa's sorrows all over the place End of chapter 3 Recording by John Brandon Chapter 4 of Tilda Jane's Orphans This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org recording by john brandon tilda jane's orphans by marshall saunders chapter four the arrival of milkweed tilda jane stood watching her huge orphan who was out in the woodhouse splitting kindling wood the orphan was having considerable trouble with poacher and the half-blind gippie who were circling about her getting persistently in the way of the hatchet with which she was giving powerful strokes to the sticks of wood she favors dogs and she's good to grandpa murmured tilda jane that's about a hundredweight off my mind then she said aloud perletta hey exclaimed the big girl turning round you needn't chop up those boxes mr hank said he would split the kindling it's not fit work for women he says go long remarked perletta i'm worth more than him any day hank's as fat as a settled minister but he ain't brawny you better not let him hear you call him hank said the little girl he'd be angry he'll not get mad about nothing said perletta cunningly not now he's too set up about that mare comin and how can he split wood when he's out in the barn all the time a fixin up that box stall tilda jane beamed all over she was almost as pleased as hank was with their new acquisition how does it be about that mare inquired perletta curiously seems like as you had her afore i never had her mr hank owned her when he was in the creamery business then he had to sell her and go into the mill and what is it he names her pursued perletta milkweed what's that for a name 
she's got little tricksy splashes of white all over her said tilda jane and i believe she was named milkweed partly owing to that and partly owing to the milk trade he was in hark don't i hear the sleigh bells now he has to come with her this afternoon when his work at the mill was over and snatching an old shawl from a hook she wrapped it around her and ran like a deer through the woodhouse door to the snowy yard hank was proudly driving in the gate he sat in a smart shiny cutter with a warm fur rug over his knees and in front of him trotted a dainty high-stepping bay mare flecked with white as if she had dashed foam from her lips over her chest and sides tilda jane gave a glad cry and running up threw her arms round the neck of the gratified animal perletta after one long look lunged into the woodhouse got two rosy-cheeked apples and putting them in her palm went out again and offered them to the new member of the family hank had sprung out and was beginning to unharness his face was aglow with satisfaction and he listened contentedly to tilda jane's purring remarks near the ear of the graceful milkweed perletta silently fed the apples then as the mare tossed her head and whinnied pleadingly she laughed and went into the house for more when at last milkweed was unharnessed hank said to her step into the barn beauty and see your new home milkweed followed him like a dog behind her was a small procession consisting of tilda jane perletta the two dogs and some tame pigeons who came waddling in with their eyes fixed on the corn barrel the jersey cow turned her head as they entered the barn and threw a benevolent glance at the mare who was to be her companion more than any other creatures for they occupied neighboring stalls the hens in the poultry house next door hearing an unusual commotion lifted up their voices in joyful anticipation of their evening meal i guess i'll git something for their crops remarked perletta in her uncouth yet kind fashion and she went lumbering toward the house to prepare their warm cornmeal supper what a joyful family we are exclaimed tilda jane gleefully you and me and perletta and the dogs and the cow and milkweed and the pigeons and the poor little sparrows she added in conclusion here little beggars let me give you something to stay you before the cold night comes as she spoke she dipped a quart measure deep in the corn barrel and threw the cracked kernels out in the yard the pigeons got the larger pieces the sparrows the smaller ones and all ate in peace and harmony folks tell me sparrows are bad said tilda jane and so they are for i saw them driving away the wild birds from the melancon's garden but ours don't fight the wild birds for we've had their nests all summer you stuff them said hank kindly they don't need to fight when there's enough for all and we don't have as many grubs on our trees as our neighbors do continued tilda jane i see the sparrows eating them sparrows eat some kind of worms said hank i've heard they were imported to destroy the looping caterpillars which used to devour the american lindens but they would not eat the hairy caterpillars and our native birds would i'm afraid your friend the sparrow is a pretty big nuisance tilda the question is how to get rid of him he's here to stay i guess i say sissy i'm powerful glad to get this mare back i know you are hank she said as she restored the dipper to the barrel 
i just can figure to myself how you feel suppose someone had had gippy away from me a whole year hank burst out laughing and threw a comical glance at the little dog who was stretching out his head sniffing violently and trying to make his nose do duty for his other senses i ain't had one minute's peace since i had to give her up said hank pausing in his operation of giving milkweed a good rub down and turning his red face toward tilda jane who stood peering at him from the folds of the shawl and wrapping her head and shoulders every hour of the day i had her before me was she overdriven and whipped when she was tired did that fellow scream at her and make her stand round she my beauty that never had a cross word it's cruel hard to have to give up an animal said tilda jane with a shudder it takes me back to my asylum days when i ran away to save gippy from being taken from me and picking up the little animal she cuddled him in her shawl i asked that fellow if he found milkweed smart and bright said hank indignantly and what do you think he said why not a bit ahead of other horses she the quickest horse wit in the old pine tree state what do you think she did just now when i was coming down wisconnet hill i don't know hank said tilda jane softly why she stopped short and turned to one side the bit had parted in her mouth and the lines were slipping through my hands any other horse would have run i never had such an accident before but she stood just like a lamb what did you do hank i jumped out pretty lively ran to her head and led her to the harness store then do you mind sissy the time she got loose in that hotel barn at the old moss glen inn yes i mind said tilda jane and at the mention of the inn a shadow passed over her face but tell me again hank it was mighty shrewd in her said hank stopping his work and wiping the perspiration from his face i was sick that night and had to hurry into the inn i forgot to warn mrs minley's man that milkweed would untie every knot except one particular kind of course her teeth was soon busy with his knot and in the morning he found her loose in the corner of the barn where mrs minley who was as untidy in her barn as she was tidy in her house had stored a lot of barbed wire some old ploughs some poultry netting and a few farm tools thrown in promiscuous there stood milkweed feet fast and before her an open door and before the open door a field of oats now any other horse would have plunged but she stood like a rock waiting for me to come the man yelled for me and it took the two of us to get her out and i had to cut some of the barbed wire with shears the dear horsey murmured tilda jane then she said bitterly when mrs minley tried to send me back to the asylum as i was running away from it she played a scampish trick on a poor orphan i must tell you what i heard about her the other day said hank with a chuckle shows how your sin does chase you and catch up with you in this world we both know mrs minley had no kind feelings in trying to send you back to the asylum she wanted to stand in with that mrs grannis who had a mortgage on her house when she came spanking up to the inn with mrs grannis and found you'd run away again the lady she was so dead set on pleasing turned on her and said you fooled me then she got nasty about the mortgage and mrs minley had to sell out she's cook somewhere in bangor now why hank 
ejaculated tilda jane you surprise me and what became of mrs minley's good sister the one who gave me a helping hand in running away she married the hired man and lives on a place his father left him near the moss glen station where i passed that woeful night in the woods said tilda jane hugging gippie a little closer oh hank what performances i've had yes you have had considerable for a young one replied hank thoughtfully i guess you took out a kind of accident policy stand over milkweed well i'm taking solid comfort in knowing ruth ann married said tilda jane heartily i knew she'd like to cause she said in a kind of piney way that she'd never had no i mean any offer she warn't what you call a rare and tearin beauty said hank dispassionately tilda jane looked distressed don't make fun of her hank i don't want to laugh at her she was good to me all the same she looked like a graven image with a wispy hank of hair curled tight at the back of it well i guess she was a good cook if i couldn't get a beauty and a cook in one i'd take the cook if she was as homely as a gridiron that reminds me said tilda jane we are going to have hot cakes tonight i must go and show perletta how to make them tilda called hank as she was running away after a last caress of milkweed i left that harness outside thinking i'd take it in the house and clean it it will make a mess in your shipshape kitchen but you'll not fuss i guess fuss no you can't do it out here or in the woodhouse you'd freeze but must you do it tonight i could wait till tomorrow i want to run out a few minutes this evening right after supper said tilda jane and i'd like to help you so if you wait till tomorrow i'll do it tonight said hank promptly handling harness ain't fit work for your small-sized hands now if that elephant there wants to help me and he nodded in the direction of the house and perletta she'd jump at it said tilda jane gaily and it's hard to get her work for the evening if she's idle she's sassy i mean saucy i'm glad she don't want to trot the streets said hank if she did we'd have to get a block and tackle to fetch her home now run along in sissy your teeth are chattering tilda jane and the dog scampered to the house and soon the little girl's face was as red as fire as she bent over the kitchen stove it seemed as if hank could not leave his newly obtained treasure that night he kept altering the straps of the gay striped rug he had bought for her he fussed with the fodder and only when the supper bell rang long and lustily for the second time could he tear himself away from her with an affectionate caress of her beautiful head her eloquent eyes followed him he knew as he went to the stable door though the whole barn had become dusky in the gathering twilight my land he ejaculated warmly there's nothing but solid satisfaction to be got out of the friendship of a horse that critter is as content to be back as i am to have her i know by the way she mumbled my sleeve and my shoulder what a tasty smell and his nostrils dilated delightedly as he entered the house end of chapter four recording by john brandon Chapter 5 of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter 5 Tilda Jane's Mysterious Errand. 
before hank gave up travelling to settle down in ciscasset tilda jane and grandpa used to take their meals in the kitchen it was convenient and made less work for the little girl when hank came home and obtained work in mr waysmith's mill he said no more eating in the kitchen we've got a small dining-room and what is it for if not for use i'll fix it up and night after night when his work at the mill was done he painted papered and refurnished until he made the dining-room the pleasantest room in the house it had one bay window looking toward the east and in this window he had put up shells for tilda jane's house plants to-night however the night of milkweed's arrival home the plants were carefully covered with newspapers to keep out the frost the red curtains were drawn and a brisk fire burned in a tiny stove tilda jane whose notions of art were yet somewhat primitive had bought a number of pictures to hang about the walls there was a highly coloured chromo of a hunting dog to suit her own fancy a winter landscape for grandpa a lurid representation of a horse for hank and for general purposes and for the good and enjoyment of the whole family a bright and staring motto worked in wool god bless our home her eyes often rested on this petition the lonely girl who had so long prayed for the blessings of a home never forgot to be grateful that she had at last attained to one whatever her trials and tribulations were underneath ran the deep current of satisfaction that she had obtained the desire of her heart in honor of milkweed's arrival there was an extra supper prepared and hank's lips curled appreciatively as he washed and brushed in the wood-house if that tilda jane ain't great he muttered as he buried his face in the clean roller towel the neatest little housekeeper and she only a young one she'll never want for anything as long as i've got a crust there'll always be two bites to it now are we all here he asked cheerfully stamping into the kitchen and surveying the dogs who were under the stove licking their lips and tilda jane and perletta who were bending over it where's my old dad here said a voice and grandpa came hobbling from his room supported by his two crutches let me clear the way sir and hank moved some chairs and made a path for the old man to enter the dining-room hey father we've got a tip-top spread to-night exclaimed hank as he helped the old man establish himself in his big armchair cold chicken and potato salad and hot biscuits and plum preserve and fruit cake and if my sense of smell don't deceive me hot cakes and coffee to come now ain't this better than old widow erring it alone grandpa casting a backward thought at his lonely life before tilda jane came to live with him muttered yes yes i guess so yes yes it's a blessing your appetite holds out hank went on affectionately it just warms the cockles of my heart to see you eat and you sleep pretty good and hard don't you yes yes said the old man suspiciously of course i sleep what do i go to bed for never have dreams said hank good-naturedly nor nightmare nightmare muttered his father indignantly don't know that kind of a mare never did never want to do you hear that tilda said hank as the little girl entered the room holding a big coffee-pot with both hands grandpa says he sleeps like a top never has nightmare tilda jane as she put the pot on the table turned her flushed face toward hank with such an unhappy stare that the young man made haste to change the subject i say he ejaculated hastily taking up the cream jug just look at that thick and yellow as gold lots of rich folks in city can't get such cream for love nor money that is a jewel of a cow by the way tilda you ain't named her yet i asked you to get something to call her by she's such a lady that i feel it ain't right to address her as if she was common cow flesh a name said tilda jane absently oh call her after the person we were speaking about a spell ago ruth ann i just loved that woman all right ruth ann let it be ruth ann minley 
no no said the little girl with a shudder i forgive mrs minley but i don't want to name any cows after her besides minley wasn't ruth ann's name i don't know what it was well we'll let it go at dilson said hank jovially ruth ann dilson give me a good strong cup of coffee and i'll drink to her health the little girl had seated herself behind the coffee pot and the cups and saucers at the head of the table hank took the foot and old mr dillson sat between them on the side away from the fire just as they were about to bow their heads for tilda jane's grace before meat perletta appeared in the doorway a knife and fork and a plate in her hand tilda jane and grandpa scarcely glanced at her for they had this performance three times a day hank was the one to attend to her and hearing the rattle of the plate he turned his head and looked over his shoulder at her there's our houri at the gate of paradise again he said ironically only no houri ever was one-tenth as sassy you've put the things on the table what are you doing there i'm just as good as you be she said doggedly i'm going to set down with you oh no you're not get back to the kitchen she began her usual protest in places where i lived before they always had me at the table i hope they enjoyed your company said hank relentlessly you must have been among the aristocracy we common folks don't appreciate you get out now when you stays out i sits there she said angrily pointing to the warm side of the table that's like you to take advantage of my absence now go i'm boss here and a girl that talks as rude as you do ain't fit to sit down with decent conversing people you turn over a new leaf and let it stay and i'll admit you i ain't proud but i can't stand sass go now eat your supper by the kitchen fire and if you're a good girl i'll let you help me clean the harness this evening i'll not clean no harness she muttered as she shambled away but they all knew that she would be delighted to do so that girl is the most powerful argufier i ever saw remarked hank in a disgusted voice i don't see how you stand her all day tilda there's lots of good in her said the little girl in a low voice and i guess she'll get less obstreperous she will if i have her long enough said hank grimly i ain't one to take impudence with a laughing face sass has its place in life but you don't want it clear i say that chicken's tender sissy is it one of ours tilda jane wrinkled her face no hank i got it in the market i know it was like being rash with your money but i just can't eat our chickens and you won't kill them nor perletta so what can i do you're all right sissy buy all the chickens you want but what will you do with ours hens are powerful birds at the multiplication table i don't know hank perhaps i can exchange them why is it that we let the hens have pretty little chickens and nurse and tend them and then just when they're grown up and company for us we turn round and kill them hank shook his head there's a good many mysteries in the world sissy that blood and thunder one is the worst we've got to kill to get on if we didn't there'd be a worse state of things that there is now did you ever think how many chickens there'd be if we never killed any no hank after supper i'll get a pencil and do a bit of calculating if every old hen in ciscasset kept her chickens i'll wager that in ten years there wouldn't be enough food in the place for her and us too we humans would have to go to the wall that's the way we keep on top we crowd everything and everybody oh not everybody hank yes everybody isn't jake wendell too mad to speak to me cause i pushed him out of getting that place in the mill mr tracy was intending to offer it to him when you plumped in and begged it for me tilda jane paused with a tempting piece of butter biscuit halfway to her mouth and am i to blame because jake wendell's family is suffering for comforts this winter no no sissy he said soothingly you're not to blame you'd rather he'd suffer than me i'd rather no one would suffer she said can't you get him something to do hank maybe i can he said comfortably but let him roust round and get something for himself it's the smart ones that get on tilda jane looked round the room so comfortable in the glowing firelight and lamplight and if i wasn't here hank there'd be some other girl here i'm crowding someone out that's it tilda 
he said good-humouredly i hope you'll lie right down and die now her glance travelled round the room once more then came back to his shining face well i just shan't she said with one of her rare flashes of humour i'm going to stay with you and grandpa hank burst into a roar of laughter and beat his hand on his knee that's right tilda do all the good you can to others but hold on to your own job if it's right she said soberly i know i'm right to bide here if i thought i was wrong hank an iron cage wouldn't hold me you bet it wouldn't he said you're the kind of young one to run away with your cage on your back hey grandpa hello said the old man in a gruff voice hello he's gone deef said hank resignedly doesn't want to talk he was all right a spell ago masticate him dad he vociferated ruminesque cat in gravy what's that hank inquired tilda jane pricking up her ears latin sissy said the young man roguishly you know i'm studying some evenings i'd like to know languages said the little girl wistfully i can say some french i took from the melancons let perletta do some more work i want you to study a lot and that reminds me when will you begin going to school next tuesday hank monday will be wash day bah let silver tongue there do the washing you favor her too much tilda i won't after this she was new at first and things look queer to her well i've had a good supper said hank getting up after a time and i'm much obliged to you sissy for taking such a lot of pains to make this a special occasion i guess i'll go out and tell milkweed about it where's the lantern in the wood-house hank near the churn and the little girl went to one of the kitchen windows to watch him going out swinging the bright light and sending exquisite rays over the banks of snow suddenly she roused at herself with a start and went back to the dining-room i must be going i have work to do this evening grandpa where do you want to sit here or in the kitchen grandpa who had mysteriously acquired his hearing said decidedly here tilda jane smiled as she turned his armchair to the fire grandpa did not say much but he did not like the new girl any better than hank did perletta said tilda jane going into the kitchen i have to run out a spell this evening run out said the big girl in surprise where are you going never mind if i wished you to know i would tell you while i'm gone i want you to clear the table and wash the dishes all alone exclaimed perletta in dismay yes all alone and be quick about it so you can help mr hank when he comes in ain't you goin out to the hen-house with me to grease them hen's legs not to-night not till to-morrow they're plumb scaly they will keep said tilda jane with dignity and she hurried away while perletta began to saunter lazily from dining-room to kitchen muttering under her breath yes hen's legs can wait no matter about hen's girls must run the streets poor hen's perletta will take the lantern and go all alone to grease their legs cock-a-doodle-doo and she gave a whoop that made poor grandpa jump in his chair End of chapter five Chapter Six of Tilda Jane's Orphans. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kathleen. Tilda Jane's Orphans by Marshall Saunders. Chapter Six A Call on the Lumber Merchant. The day's work was over for Mr. Waysmith, the stout, prosperous looking lumber merchant and the richest man in ciscasset his evening was just beginning and he sat alone in his luxurious library where none of the family ever penetrated unless at his request he had spent his usual number of hours at his desk in the office at the mill he had had his daily drive and his dinner and now came his time of relaxation many of the latest magazines were on the table by his side he was stretched out in an easy chair with his feet to a cosy fire and sounds of music came from the distant parlor where his wife and children with a number of their friends were amusing themselves last but not least over in the corner lay his inseparable friend companion and guardian the creature who lived only for him but in such a unobtrusive way that many persons never suspected his existence come here muffles 
he said suddenly and he held out a hand a thoroughbred bulldog whole coloured and with a black mask of a face came composedly from a shadowy corner he did not lick the hand extended to him he merely touched it with his black muzzle and was about to return to his corner when his master said up here the task of springing to the easy chair was a light one to a dog of such a powerful front he scarcely seemed to move as he sprang then he spread his stout and muscular limbs across mr waysmith's knee and lifted his massive head to his face courage tenacity unyielding stubbornness murmured mr waysmith but in spite of that enormous head no more brains than other dogs you're something like me muffles i'm not brilliant i get on because i hold fast the dog never moved a muscle for that reason he was mr waysmith's closest confidant you listen and make no sign continued the merchant yet you never sleep where i am concerned twice you have saved my life muffles don't die i could not replace you the dog did not wag his tail nor did he lick the caressing fingers and finally as if thinking there is nothing new or remarkable in these observations he turned his stolid gaze to the fire presently he roused himself and looked toward the door some one is come said mr waysmith composedly though i hear nothing get into your corner the dog obeyed him stealing like a substantial shadow behind a sofa an instant later some one knocked at the door and when mr waysmith said come in a bright faced young irish maid announced with assumed boldness that a young girl wished to see him he frowned slightly send her away tell her my office is the place where i see strangers sure and i did sir but instead of gettin out she's all for gettin in and the housekeeper is afeard she'll not take advice that she'll take a cold instead or she'll be for climbin up the stoop and insinuatin herself through a wonder she's that wild to git in mr waysmith had a great regard for his old housekeeper's opinion he had also a slight suspicion that this young girl did not look upon him with proper respect therefore with a desire to suppress her and to get rid of messages from his audacious caller he said curtly bring her in his suspicion with regard to irish mary was quite unfounded she stood in awe of him quite as much as the rest of the world and her flow of information had been prompted by nervousness therefore with a relieved gasping yes sir she closed the door and disappeared mr waysmith did not recognize the dark respectable-looking half-grown girl who quietly entered and drawing himself up in his chair he fixed her with a solemn steady stare tilda jane was not as nervous as irish mary but still she had considerable dread of this ponderous dignified man she had forced herself into his presence and she supposed he would be very angry with her very much to her relief he was indulging only in cold disdain the high up folks know how to get mad proper she murmured that yelling and firing things like poor grandpa upsets me awful excuse me sir she continued aloud and leaning against a corner of the table as he did not ask her to sit down i've got something to say to you that'll make you prick up your ears just like a dog's something about business this word changed the character of the forced interview mr waysmith was at all times the alert man of affairs this girl might have something important to communicate to him some disaster might threaten him perhaps some evil disposed person was about to fire his lumber yards he had been warned of this before sit down he said with cold politeness pointing to a nearby chair i say business remarked tilda jane as she obeyed him it's part of your business part mine i guess you don't call me to mind sir he did not for he was slowly shaking his head and she went on do you call up the time sir when a poor little girl asked you for money on the train and you wouldn't give it a gleam of recollection not agreeable recollection passed over his face your son kind of took pity on me that day he's got a nice face sir bright and shiny-looking and he's awful handsome favors his ma now sir 
i guess i'd like to see that young fellow good and prospering and not standing in the way of sinners nor sitting in the seat of the scornful mr waysmith acknowledged these good wishes by a stately bow but first i must go back on my tracks said tilda jane pulling herself up briskly you'd like to have some account of me since i last set eyes on you i was in a peck of trouble then and i've had a few courts since but things have changed with me sir i suppose you know the tracys mr waysmith again bowed they're good folks sir truly good i go to see them once in so often and they fix things all up between me and that old man what old man mr dillson sir he that was your bookkeeper don't you mind i was coming to keep house for him her companion's heavy face brightened at the mention of a familiar name and he assured her that he did not recall the circumstance yes sir she continued the tracys got mr dillson or grandpa as i call him to say i could bide with him and they used to send us tasty things to eat then mr tracy got hank that good place in your mill as assistant bookkeeper this was not news to mr waysmith and he wrinkled his forehead in slight impatience tilda jane felt his impatience but she was launched and could not stop herself well sir as i was saying i'm living with grandpa and i'm getting to set more store by him every day he isn't all tiger as your son said he was i've found some lamb in him and i'd just like your son to come and see him on one of his lammy days if i was sure when one was coming on i'd send for him but grandpa's chancy i like your son he's so free-like and chatty and always stops me in the street and asks me how i'm getting on i'm not afraid of him like i am of you sir what was the girl working up to mr waysmith withdrew the thumb marking a place in the partly closed magazine on his knee and putting it on the table took up another he was master of a number of small devices calculated to hurry a long-winded caller he was just about to stand up when something occurred that effectually aroused his interest his dog the quiet undemonstrative muffles was coming deliberately from his corner to inspect this small girl mr waysmith was quietly amazed he watched the dog go up to tilda jane sniff curiously about her dress then stand on his hind legs calmly search her face and as if satisfied and charmed with his scrutiny gently licked her hand and this was the dog who rarely caressed his master and never by any chance gave a stranger more than a searching glance after watching him go back to his corner mr waysmith said are you fond of dogs oh yes sir she said eloquently don't you mind that day i met you on the train i had one dog in my arms and the other in the baggage car i just love them i think i must be a kind of sister to dogs he said nothing and she continued don't be jealous sir of that there dog which i see is a quiet one that doesn't favor strangers he just knows i love him and he's trying to tell me he knows it because we may never meet again go on with your story said mr waysmith in a non-committal way well sir she said feverishly i'm right in the dillson family now and we are quite a family there's ruth ann the cow and milkweed the horse and our new orphan perletta and the pigeons and sparrows and the dear comfy hens and that reminds me i ought to be home now greasing the hens legs cause they've got the scaly disease but i thought your son's soul ought to come first i love animals but i always make them come after the humans now being a member of the family i can't help taking in that grandpa isn't a good sleeper and she paused and closely scrutinized her hearer to see whether he showed any sign of emotion at this statement he did not it was in no wise remarkable that an old man should be a light sleeper grandpa's got something on his mind sir said the little girl hastily and i guess you're the only one that could get it off it's been on ever since i come here last year i thought it was trouble on account of sixty dollars he lost in the street and never got but it's not the sixty dollars this is higher trouble 
but i know you could get it off instead of being overcome by this announcement mr waysmith stifled a yawn he wished this young girl would stop posing about an old man who had long since left his employ and would take herself away her announcement of business must have been a mere pretext to beg dillson was a good trustworthy bookkeeper in his day he said patronizingly take this and buy some little delicacy for him tilda jane would not touch the five-dollar note he was offering her and her face grew crimson i'm not begging sir it's mind trouble that i'm trying to explain well why did she not explain it he wondered why did she hesitate and stammer and fall into such a state of confusion i'm not set in my opinions sir she said reading his thoughts surely i'm not sure i'm on the right track yet i'm all broke up about poor grandpa if he confesses to you i guess you'd forgive him particularly as i've got something to tell about forgiving someone else mr waysmith looked coldly interested and a trifle suspicious oh it's a lovely thing to forgive exclaimed the little girl eloquently to have your heart all melted down and soft like the rivers in the spring and not to have icy feelings any more i used to be a little mad with grandpa and now i can't get mad cause i've given it all up i'd like to see him happy sir the lumber merchant only slightly touched by her eulogium on the pleasures of forgiveness had suddenly become possessed of a lively curiosity dillson had done him wrong and this girl had found it out if you speak out plainly and tell me what you have to say i will consider your statement he remarked judicially i pay no attention to enigmas i don't know what enigmas are responded tilda jane desperately but i know something about your son you'd give ten piles of lumber to know her companion regarded her for the silent and solemn space of one minute then he said you wish to effect a bargain you have a secret with regard to my son to barter for my forgiveness of some wrong-doing on the part of dillson it doesn't sound pretty to put it that way said tilda jane struggling with some inner and powerful emotion but let it go now you will promise to say that thing is past and gone i forgive you and don't yell any more in your sleep the only way in which dillson has been able to injure me is by defrauding me of money he probably has done that said mr waysmith coolly s'pose he had replied tilda jane wildly s'pose he had taken money s'pose he didn't think then he was sorry what would you do would you forgive him mr waysmith did not like being cross-questioned by one so immeasurably his inferior however he wished to obtain the rest of her information so he said calmly as a general thing i punish i do not forgive you don't oh sir why not forgiveness doesn't pay my girl there is no such thing in business you wouldn't drag him to jail would you she cried her eyes wide open in horror calm yourself and lower your voice when i understand the case more fully i will decide what to do now your information about my son oh i can't tell you sir not unless you promise to go see grandpa and tell him you forgive him and let him lie in peace in his bed you ought to go into trade young girl you would make your fortune oh i'm not thinking of trading i'm thinking of having people happy and comfortable oh sir you will come and see grandpa and you will forgive him when dillson comes to me and confesses what he has done it will be time enough for me to say what i will do but he's scared out of his life sir he's more afraid of you than of a great big ugly bear with a sore paw he was evidently not scared enough of me to keep from injuring me tilda jane was terribly upset she rose from her seat and stood opening and shutting her mouth without uttering a word and nervously clasping and unclasping her hands oh those little pig eyes she muttered to herself he's just steeped in selfishness he isn't willing to forgive he's mad with grandpa maybe he'll tell him what i've said and grandpa'll be mad with me oh dear i wish i'd been born without a tongue i've done no good have you anything more to say young girl asked mr waysmith deliberately he had risen now and was staring down at her in a magnificent way he wants me to go said tilda jane between her closed teeth 
i shan't tell him anything about his son i shan't give him the wink he'd be glad to get let him find out said she her lips pressed oh lord keep me from saying anything hateful to him with a last reproachful stare she hurriedly walked out of the room looking at him peculiarly over her shoulder as she did so and keeping her mouth tightly closed her manner was sufficient mr waysmith understood her and with a frown he stepped to the door and turned the key in the lock tilda jane heard him and stamping her foot with rage and impatience she hurried out of the house and down the steps to the gravelled walk though she had gone she had made an impression she had spoiled mr waysmith's evening all interest had left the magazine pages and he'd let the one in his hand slip to the floor and stared thoughtfully at the fire did any danger threaten his boy the only child he had or was this girl a story-teller probably she was she had concocted some fable in order to wheedle him into forgiveness of his pensioner dilson Dadis was doing well with his studies he had safe companions he bade fair to make a model man true he talked a good deal and boasted more than his father liked but those were faults of youth the girl was a dishonourable and scheming little witch and with sudden anger and impatience against her the merchant went to the bookcase for his shakespeare and forced himself to read a few minutes later he closed the volume with an irritated exclamation staring him in the face were the lines i forgive you as i would be forgiven he would go to bed his head ached the room was hot and he was just rising and extending a hand to turn off the lights when he heard a tapping at the window beyond him end of chapter six chapter seven of tilda jane's orphans this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by dini stain in colonna canada tilda jane's orphans by marshall saunders chapter seven his only son he turned sharply around someone wished to come in the low french window and to his surprise he discovered the dark face of the irrepressible orphan a face subdued and calm however and with a decidedly red nose she had been crying in obedience to her pleading gesture he unfastened the window and slowly opened it sir gasped the little girl quickly but gently i've not got one drop of breath left but i've come to say that you were ugly to me just now and i was ugly to you and i'm sorry and i guess you are too i ought to forgive you for not forgiving grandpa and i'll tell you about your son come up close so no one will hear mr waysmith did not like the informality of this second interview yet his strange caller had so whetted his curiosity that he was extremely anxious to hear what she had to say and he invited or rather commanded her to enter the room tilda jane obeyed him pantingly and fairly dropping in a seat she began in excited sentences that curly-haired boy of yours is getting to be a young man but i guess to you he seems like a little fellow yet and i though i dare say he's more than eighteen feel like he was a child and i can just see him peeking over the edge of one of those pits the bible tell us of maybe you don't know some good french people that live next grandpa's the man works in the penobscot bakery and his wife's a great friend of mine and she tells me there's a bad cajun way down at the end of french row by the river and he lets big boys come to his house and play cards for money mr waysmith looked hard and unbelieving his son was in the house every night of his life tilda jane's eyes were devouring his face you don't credit me sir well you just watch and if i could tell you how it makes me shiver to set you spying on that nice son of yours you pity me but it's to save his soul sir for the french people are very firm about curbing children and they say he runs with a bad set of young men at the cajuns not french boys sir 
they're town boys and they don't go in the evenings when you might be apt to smell a rat but they go afternoons when college is out and you think they're at that place where they leap and play it's something like a man's name jim something gymnasium supplied mr waysmith that's it sir they say they'll cut jim and they run to the frenchman's you lie and wait for them sir you'll see mr waysmith showed no other sign of emotion than a profound thoughtfulness but tilda jane was apprehensive don't get mad with him sir please don't she said pleadingly the lady boards used to get mad with me and it didn't do a mite of good but if any one talked soft i just broke all up i guess if you take him with you sir or get him in with nice boys he'd be all right and don't let him know i told on him sir mr waysmith's eyes were fixed on the carpet he believed now every word that the girl was saying but he was filled with a profound chagrin he knew the duplicity of some forms of young manhood yet he had imagined that his lad was a transparent lad that every thought in his youthful breast was open to him and that he could read his guileless face as he could read a book and this son this model son had been deceiving him and moreover had been taking pleasure in the deceit however he must dismiss this girl and raising his head he said hastily i thank you for your information may i ask you to tell no other person of this i wouldn't blab sir not if you gave me another dog said tilda jane earnestly if you knew what i've gone through before i could screw myself up to say this much it was as if you were the dentist sir and you had your tongs all ready to haul out one of my teeth good night sir don't get in any cave of despair about your son for the good french people say he isn't cut out for any card sharper they said as how you'd fetch him round all right good night said mr waysmith calmly and going to the window he unlocked it and though tilda jane threw him several pleading glances he gave her no assurances either with regard to grandpa or datus he's thinking it over murmured tilda jane's he's slower than a tortoise but maybe he'll get there quicker than the hare which is me mr waysmith stood watching the little dark figure scurrying down the path then closing the window he stood leaning heavily against the frame his boy an incipient gambler what, what could he do how could he control this youthful fever how could he a reserved phlegmatic man express to the volatile youth his intense affection for him perhaps he had not been enough with him perhaps he had been too cold too uninterested in the boy's pursuits no it was not that datus knew that he loved him Datus was proud of him as a father. There was something lacking in the boy's makeup. He had a weak sense of honor, and he was self-indulgent. He did not consider the end, and now probably he had got in with enticing companions and was following their lead. Now that he thought of it, Charlie True, one of his best friends, was the son of a man who belonged to a family notorious for their love of gambling the father did not live at home but the lad had probably inherited the family proclivity after some time he roused himself and went into the hall where is mr datus he asked addressing irish mary who was locking the front door he's just gone up to his bed sir and i don't think he's been after comin down since he went up ask him to come down to the library he went back to his room and sat down by the fire and presently his son appeared, careless and unsuspecting. "'You caught me in the nick of time, papa. I was just going to undress. Do you want something?' "'Why do you stand in that hunchback fashion?' asked his father irritably. "'Straighten your shoulders, boy!' Datus took a more soldier-like attitude, but Mr. Waysmith continued in the same dissatisfied tone i'm spending a good deal of money on athletics for you but i don't see that your figure improves what time do you go to the gymnasium at four o'clock sir when afternoon classes are over i will meet you there tomorrow and have a talk with your teacher he's neglecting you according to your appearance stretch out your hand datus going from red to white extended a pretty girlish hand 
soft and flabby said his father i shall have something to say to what is your instructor's name mcintyre said datus feebly he must be scamping his work said mr waysmith disdainfully i met your friend true to-day and he looks as white as milk and just about as flabby as you don't you ever run on that outdoor track yes sir said datus almost inaudibly the young man was doing a rapid amount of thinking did his father know anything if he did how much did he know would it not be better to undeceive him now than to have him confronted with mcintyre to-morrow and have a painful explanation at the gymnasium mcintyre was an honorable man he would not lie he would tell mr waysmith frankly that his son had not been coming to his classes regularly papa said datus stammeringly i must confess to you that i have not been going to the gymnasium every day why not asked his father bluntly well sir i that is true and i and some of the fellows found it slow and we've been going to other places to the rink inquired mr waysmith have you been skating not much lately sir we go to different places sometimes downtown has it occurred to you that this non-attendance at the gymnasium was a breach of contract on your part if you no longer wish to go why did you not ask me to permit you to leave i have been paying out hard-earned money for instruction you did not receive i'm sorry papa ejaculated datus with a crimson face i did not look at it in that light it was hard on you i will begin to-morrow and go regularly but what about the past said his father calmly how will you make that right datus hesitated an instant then he said frankly i don't know please tell me sir you are actually asking for advice said mr waysmith musingly you a modern stripling well that is a step in advance we old fellows were made to sit at the feet of our parents when young and take advice whether we wanted it or not and were also made to act upon it the present generation thinks itself wiser than its fathers i don't think myself wiser than you said datus humbly luxury is spoiling you continued his father still in a musing tone i had little as a boy not enough perhaps having obtained a fortune i delight in lavishing it on my children you've had toys pets fine clothes trips abroad more than you can stand poor lad i have weakened you instead of strengthening you in common with thousands of other rich men's sons you are agreeably wending your way to the dogs and when i say dogs i don't mean dogs you mean devil said datus with a gleam of humor in his blue eyes yes my lad and that you can take my statement so coolly shows the weak sappy moral fibre you've been running to now what are we going to do about this datus uncomfortably stubbed his toe back and forth against a footstool are you willing to help me in trying to make a man of yourself asked mr waysmith calmly datus gave him a reproachful glance i want to be a good smart man sir just like you his father's face softened you have not been afraid of me datus you have not felt that i was uninterested in you oh no sir only you are so taken up with your business i hate to disturb you though i'd often like to talk to you he added frankly mr waysmith winced and his eyes fell before the youthful ones fixed in admiration on him perhaps i have been partly to blame he said slowly in future we will mend that now datus you want discipline the lad shuddered but said bravely all right sir when you play cards do you mostly win or lose asked his father datus's face became a fiery red his father knew about his card parties sir he said hesitatingly i mostly lose but i have a few winnings here and he jingled some loose coin in his pocket how much asked mr waysmith briefly count it datus drew out the silver one dollar and forty cents he said shamefacedly give it to mr tracy for his poor people you will of course not go to the acadians any more no sir and i promise you not to touch a card again until you give me leave very good so far 
Now, what has your allowance for pocket money been? Seven dollars a week, sir. Simpleton that I've been, said Mr. Waysmith angrily. Some families live on less. I cut your allowance down to a dollar fifty a week. Your clothes and books and foods are bought for you. Why should a mere stripling like you have seven dollars a week? Upon my word, it is the fault of two indulgent parents that their boys go astray. Some fellows have more, suggested Datus. Trusty fellows might have a hundred a week, retorted Mr. Waysmith. Weaklings like you should have a nickel only at a time. Datus winced, but said nothing. Every day after college is over, you report to me at the mill, said Mr. Waysmith. I'll find work there for you to do, and if I discover that you are deceiving me in any way, I shall pack you right off to your grandfather's. Not to that farm in the woods, asked Datus in dismay. The same, so toe the mark if you want to stay here. There's no college there, remarked Datus. There's a school that was good enough for me when I was a lad, and it is better now, but if you go there it will be to do farm work. There are hardly any neighbors, pursued Datus. Not a chap my own age. All the better. Middle-aged and old men won't lead you into mischief. I guess I'll behave myself and stay here, said Datus shrewdly. You won't send me away from you, will you, Daddy? And he laid a cajoling hand on his father's arm. Mr. Waysmith turned and looked him in the eyes. For a few seconds they remained motionless the man sitting staring into the relieved and roguish face so near his own. The lad was as quiescent as his father. He was weak in some ways, yet there was a strain of bravery in him. Go to bed, boy, said Mr. Waysmith, shaking off the caressing hand. There's something about your mental makeup that I don't like, but maybe we'll straighten you out. Datus suddenly flung his arm around the broad shoulders near him, and after giving them a boyish, bearish hug, he scampered from the room. Mr. Waysmith sat shaking his head by the fire. What is wrong with the boys of today? The riches of our hearts and our pockets are lavished on them, and yet they are shrewd and commercial in their instincts, and at the same time self-indulgent and short-sighted. There must be something wrong with our system of education. It's all hard intellect. That boy wants heart culture. I've more genuine affection for him in my little finger than he has for me in his whole body, and yet he makes more show with what he has than I do with all I have that he hasn't. I don't know what I'm to do unless I stop doing. He has had everything since he was born, and he does nothing for anybody. Perhaps that's it. He's in the grip of egotism and is being slowly eaten up. I'll set him to work serving others. He doesn't know the joy of service, and he doesn't understand the value of money. I was a mischievous boy in some ways, but I never was a rogue, and I was crammed with ambition. Then my father was a poor man. The merchant sat for some time in deep reverie. Then he said aloud, How men are misjudged. That young orphan here tonight thinks I'm a hard-hearted monster, and my Datus is an earthly paragon. She once begged from me on the train, and I, a man pestered to death with little demoralized children teasing for pennies, would not, as I thought, contribute to her degradation. Datus, without a care of her welfare, gave to her. As it happened, hers was a deserving case. She is out of the common. I will help her if possible, but first I must look into Dilson's affair. Hey ho! And, rising, he stretched out his arms with a perplexed gesture. They say children are a blessing from the Lord, a thorny blessing in some cases. End of chapter 7